Yes. Okay. Good morning again. And I have the uh, great pleasure of introducing our speaker today is Megan King. Megan grew up in the UP and went to school at MSU. Go green. Um, she received her bachelor's degree in political theory and constitutional democracy. She has loved grassroots community organizing since her internship in a human rights advocacy organization in Cape Town, South Africa. And she's been working at the Women's Resource Center of Northern Michigan since 2015 as the Violence Prevention Coordinator. And I'm very uh, grateful that we have Megan and Gail joining us this morning. So thank you very much and take it away, Megan. All right, thank you so much. Um, I'm really happy that you guys had uh, made some of the time uh, for me to come here today and talk a little bit about the Violence Prevention Program at the Women's Resource Center. Um, so I'm going to start off with a little bit of, um, so April is right around the corner and that is traditionally uh, acknowledged as Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Um, and that's on the state, local and national level. Um, and it's an opportunity for us to kind of focus on sexual violence as a public health issue and what we can do to stop it. Um, my work with the Women's Resource Center is uh, in the primary prevention of gender-based violence. So primary prevention is looking at the root causes of violence and addressing those root causes. And when you look at the, and if you address the cause at the root, you have the opportunity to prevent the violence from happening before it has a chance to happen in the first place. Um, so the good news about primary prevention is that every single person has an opportunity to be a part of violence prevention in that way. And I'm gonna get into a little bit more about um, specific examples of what people can do in just a bit. Um, but I wanna talk about what some of these uh, primary prevention strategies are first. Um, so my program, uh, the grant that funds my program comes from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, um, and they've identified certain what they call protective factors uh, for preventing sexual violence. Um, and just a couple of those are like community support and connectedness, uh, coordination of services and resources uh, for young people, connection with a caring adult, um, emotional health and connectedness, and then empathy and concern for how one's actions affect others. Now you might notice there is a theme through a lot of those of this community connectedness piece. Um, and that is because there is research that shows that communities that have high levels of connectedness actually see less sexual violence and other forms of violence, abuse and neglect. Um, connected communities are ones where members support and trust one another and feel closely tied to one another. Um, and uh, communities with these high levels of connectedness also tend to hold people who choose to perpetrate violence accountable, as well as provide more support systems for victims. Um, and so on the other side of that, you have something called uh, the social determinants of health, which is essentially just like a fancy way of saying like how, what these environmental factors of where you grew up or born or where you work how those environmental factors can impact your health. And that also has an impact on sexual violence. Um, and so some of those include uh, social norms and attitudes, which includes things like racism, sexism, ableism, and other forms of oppression, um, socioeconomic conditions. So like, what is, what are, is there poverty? Is there a lot of income inequality, um, equitable access to economic and educational and job opportunities? Uh, again, community engagement and these community support systems. So if those things are present in a community, you will have less sexual violence and you will have better overall community health. Um, so sexual violence is really, really deeply tied to oppression um, and focusing on these protective factors and social determinants of health can help clarify how anti-oppression efforts can be part of prevention. So we have a really cool thing coming up, which I'm hoping people will be interested in participating in that really helps tie all of these issues together. Uh, so the Women's Resource Center is hosting a virtual screening of a doc and a panel discussion of a documentary 
uh, called The Great American Lie. Uh, so this really focuses on um, economic immobility, social inequality, um, and how that can be viewed through the lens of gender. Um, it's uh, done by uh, the Representation Project, who has done films like Misrepresentation and The Mask You Live In, both excellent films. Um, and uh, it's actually really cool that we're going to be able to do this in a virtual streaming platform, um, which means people will be able to stream this uh, during a week long window on their own time. Um, so that's not a specific day or time that you have to be uh, at a place to, to view it. But I would like to share with you all the um, just the trailer for the film so you guys can get a, a sense of how the, all of these issues are tying together. Goodbye. Now let's see if I can do a screen love share. Goodbye. Goodbye. Love goodbye. Oh, it looks like I should be able to and make sure I'm sharing sound. All right, can we see my screen? Income inequality is the issue of today. The top 1%, look at how that has climbed. That's not an income gap, that is an income canyon. When the family you're born into, the zip code where you're born, determines your destiny, that tears at the fabric of the American dream. We're a society of do-it-yourself. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. When you don't have boots, it's hard. The narrative is you work hard and you're rewarded for it. And I see so many people working very hard and not being rewarded with even a basic living wage. Here I am, 20 years out of law school, but between the mortgage, childcare, the car payments, we are constantly broke. When the mill shut down, all the social problems came about. We've had 40 years of suffering. Enough is enough. What we need is one fair wage. We It's hard to imagine how America remains the beacon of economic and social opportunity. What's at stake is fundamentally what America is about. We create inequalities by what we choose to value and what we choose to ignore. Politicians always find money for activities that are stereotypically masculine. Weapons, wars, prisons, but they can't find enough money for anything that we have learned to call feminine, childcare, healthcare, education. The very investments that we so need, not only for human development, but for economic development. It costs us a lot more to allow this level of poverty to exist than it would cost to fix it. But to fix it would require some empathy and compassion that America lacks. There's a lot of hypocrisy today in the American dream, and that's a tragedy. Okay, so that was just a fun little sneak peek into our film screening. Um, and I will actually, if it's okay, drop in the chat the link if anybody wants to register for that. Um, or you can go to our website, um, wrcnm.org, and they and there's a, a, sorry, I can't talk and like type at the same time. <laughs> Megan, that's okay, because Carlin will be sure to put it in. We do okay. it there. So Carlin, I, he's shaking his head. He'll put that in the newsletter. Excellent. Yeah. yeah, so it's on our website. There's the film screening and panel discussion. So you can um, find all that information there about how to stream um, that film and everything. Uh, so I don't want to end on kind of the depressing note of there's all of this inequality and there's all of this hard stuff uh, that's going on in our country. Even though that is true, I want everybody to kind of leave with this sense that there is things that you all can do to be a part of um, changing society and making things more equitable and preventing sexual and gender-based violence. 
Um, and so there's a couple things. One is learning more about the issues, which I think there's a, there's a really good opportunity coming up in April of this documentary to learn some more. Um, not so subtle plug there. Um, and then also uh, think about your sphere of influence. Think about uh, the people or the institutions that you have kind of influence with. Um, and it could be like friends and family or businesses or government, whatever it is for a person, you, if you have influence in that sphere, there are things that you can do just in your everyday actions that help uh, create a safe and thriving community um, because it really is all about that community. Uh, so I wanna highlight one example really quick um, from our community about um, how a business really decided to uh, look at the things that they could do within their business and their workplace as a community and how that has improved things for their business and um, as, and helps prevent gender-based violence. Uh, so the Women's Resource Center just started running a men's group uh, for men who are interested in um, working as allies in this violence prevention um, sort of strategy that we are working on. Um, and in our most recent meeting, we had uh, Ben Van Dam from Van Dam Custom Boats come and speak about the cultural fundamentals is what they call them, uh, that they have developed and instituted over the past several years. Um, and so these cultural fundamentals are um, a way to set like baseline expectations for all of the employees and everybody who works there. And they include things like, you know, work hard and good communication and all of that. But they also include things like valuing family time and having no tolerance for abusive language or behavior. Um, and so Ben really talked about how it was an effort to really get those uh, institutionalized. Like this is something that we do. This is something that we follow every day. It impacts all of our work and all of our personal lives. Um, but when they, they have been institutionalized there now, and they've noticed that it increases um, employee morale, it has increased employee retention, and it's all tied to that fact that when you have this connected and cohesive community that's coming from shared values, you are creating a place that is safe and um, where people feel respected. Uh, and so the men's group, we are really looking at how each person in that group can use their sphere of influence to try and implement something like that. It doesn't have to be the exact same thing, but how you're working from this shared set of values. And actually I thought it was uh, really funny because I, I had to write it down and you guys were talking about the four-way test. That is such a perfect way to build this community here for Rotary. Like if you're following all of those shared values, so it doesn't have to be a huge project that you're taking on. It's, it's, it's making that shared values in your, in your little community here in your club. Um, and so I know you guys wanna wrap up by, by uh, 8.15. So I will leave some, some minutes here for questions, conversation, anything, impressions anyone has. Great job, Megan. Thank you for being here. And, and I assume I know the answer to this question, but just asking, my daughters don't live here locally, but I would love to have them watch the film um, and my son as well. Could I, if they're not here locally, they can still dial, um, register and be a part of it, correct? Absolutely. Yep. That's the fun thing. There's That's the silver lining of doing everything virtually is that you don't have to physically be there. Um, so yes, they will absolutely be able to access that. Thank you. Megan, you, you mentioned that um, connected communities have less violence towards women. How would you um, evaluate the uh, Petoskey or Northern Michigan area uh, in, in, along those lines of connectedness? That is a really great question. Um, I'm not sure about like, so I would say that there are the metrics as far as people being involved in different community groups like this, like, like Rotary. There's also just the general um, of people. Do you, do you feel like people are looking out for one another? Do you feel like people are holding other people accountable? Do people feel safe and respected in the community? Like looking at all of those metrics and then also looking at um, who are the people that you're seeing? Are you only seeing people who look like you and are in similar positions to you? Or are you seeing um, people who 
um, are economically disadvantaged or people who are uh, black or indigenous, um, things like that. And looking at how those different things or people with disabilities, how those people, are they also being included in the looking out for others and, and standing up for others? Mm -hmm. So and, I don't yeah, have uh, research or documentation in front of me as far as community connectedness. Um, although I do believe the health department did one maybe five years ago now, a, a community needs assessment that does have some of that information in there. And do you, how do you see the um, actual level of sexual uh, violence in, in our community compared to other communities? So that is a hard question to answer um, because a lot of times sexual violence is not something that's reported. Um, and so instances aren't necessarily recorded. Um, so we can look at things like uh, people who have reached out to us for services and we can have numbers as far as that goes. Um, but there, we also know that there are a lot of people who will not uh, reach out for services for a lot of different reasons. Um, so it is a little bit difficult to kind of evaluate from community to community. Uh, there was a statewide survey that was done um, just a couple years ago, and they really identified community connectedness as one of the, the major um, issues that people seem to agree were um, impacting the gender-based violence in their communities. Megan, um, is, is there any group that's working on community connectedness in particular. I used to work with a group called National Neighborhood uh, Day, and that day is September 28th. And in Providence, Rhode Island, well, we had like a campaign, you know, so that if people would in their own little block radius or neighborhood radius, at least get acquainted with their neighbors and, you know, campaign citywide to make that happen. I wonder, could I hook up with somebody who's already working on initiatives that are about community? Well, I will say that my program is pretty focused on community connection. Okay, right. <laughs> um, I mean, beyond, I, beyond women's sorry. violence it is? What's that? Be beyond women and violence it is? Yes. So oh, okay. that's, that's the connection piece of, uh, you. if you create these connected communities, then the result is, is less violence. Um, but the connected communities also have a lot of other benefits. It actually reminds me a lot of the, was it the conscientious capitalism thing from um, the chamber? Like, so you, there's a lot of benefits besides just reducing violence against women. Um, it, it helps with homelessness, it helps with uh, environment, it helps with all sorts of things when people are invested in their communities. Well, I'll connect with you offline on that. That sounds great, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, Carlin, if, if you could maybe include Megan's contact information, is that okay, Megan? So anybody oh, can yeah. reach out? Okay. Absolutely. Cool. All right. Well, thank you. That was a great program. And um, I got the link up. I'm ready to register. So, <laughs> uh, and then Carlin will have it in our newsletter too for anybody that um, doesn't have it yet. Megan, All can right? I remind you to stop recording now, please? Or just make me the host and I'll do it. Okay. And stop recording. Okay.